Good morning. We are uh, halfway through uh, the first chapter, but I thought I would begin, uh, if you're interested, uh, by reading you the uh, introduction, which is now written, although it's not, it wasn't written at the time that you got uh, the uh, copy. It's the first four pages uh, that precede what you now have. Uh, and several people have asked me, how can you motivate people and explain the branches of philosophy and say everything you need to orient them to the entire book in four pages? So if you're interested, it'll only take a couple of minutes. You can see what I did, uh, how I did it. Uh, as you'll see, I, I relied heavily on one quote uh, from Ayn Rand, but even so, I said a few things, and this will be the actual beginning. <clears throat> Philosophy is not a bauble of the intellect, but a power from which no man can abstain. Anyone can say that he dispenses with the view of reality, knowledge, the good, but no one can implement this credo. The reason is that man, by his nature as a conceptual being, cannot function at all without some form of philosophy to serve as his guide. Ayn Rand discusses the role of philosophy in her West Point lecture, Philosophy, Who Needs It? Quote, without abstract ideas, she says, you would not be able to deal with concrete, particular, real life problems. You would be in the position of a newborn infant to whom every object is a unique, unprecedented phenomenon. The difference between his mental state and yours lies in the number of conceptual integrations your mind has performed. You have no choice about the necessity to integrate your observations, your experiences, your knowledge into abstract ideas, i.e. into principles." Unquote. Your only choice, she continues, is whether your principles are true or false, rational or irrational, uh, consistent or contradictory. The only way to know is to integrate your principles. And one more quote from her. What integrates them? And quoting them. Philosophy. A philosophic system is an integrated view of existence. As a human being, you have no choice about the fact that you need a philosophy. Your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought and scrupulously logical deliberation, or let your subconscious accumulate a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified wishes, doubts, and fears, thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy, infused into a single solid weight, self-doubt, like a ball and chain in the place where your mind's wings should have grown." Unquote. That's quite a sentence. Philosophy, in Ayn Rand's view, is the fundamental force shaping every man and culture. It is the science which guides men's conceptual faculty, and thus every field of endeavor which counts on this faculty. The deepest issues of philosophy are the deepest root of men's thought, parenthesis, see chapter 4, their action, see chapter 12, their history, see the epilogue and therefore of their triumphs, their disasters, their future. Philosophy is a human need as real as the need of food. It is a need of the mind without which man cannot obtain his food or anything else his life requires. To satisfy this need, one must recognize that philosophy is a system of ideas. By its nature as an integrating science, it cannot be a grab bag of isolated issues. All philosophic questions are interrelated, that sentence underscored. One may not, therefore, raise any such questions at random without the requisite context. If one tries the random approach, then questions which one has no means of answering simply proliferate in all directions. Suppose, for example, that you read an article by Ayn Rand and glean from it only one general idea with which you decide you agree. Man should be selfish. How, you must soon ask, is this generality to be applied to concrete situations? What is selfishness? Does it mean doing whatever you feel like doing? What if your feelings are irrational? But who is to say what's rational or irrational? And who is Ayn Rand to say what a man should do anyway? 
Maybe what's true for her isn't true for you, or what's true in theory isn't true in practice. What is truth? Can it vary from one person or realm to another? And come to think of it, aren't we all bound together? Can anyone ever really achieve private goals in this world? If not, there's no point in being selfish. What kind of world is it? And if people followed Ayn Rand, wouldn't that lead to monopolies or cutthroat competition, as the socialists say? And how does anyone know the answers to all these and many similar questions? What method of knowledge should a man use? And how does one know that? For a philosophic idea to function properly as a guide, one must know the full system to which it belongs. An idea plucked from the middle is of no value, cannot be validated, and will not work. One must know the idea's relationship to all the other ideas that give it context, definition, application, proof. One must know all this not as a theoretical end in itself, but for practical purposes. One must know it to be able to rely on an idea, to make rational use of it, and ultimately to live. In order to approach philosophy systematically, one must begin with its basic branches. Philosophy, according to objectivism, consists of five branches. The two basic ones are metaphysics and epistemology. <clears throat> metaphysics is the branch of philosophy <clears throat> that studies the nature of the universe as a whole. The objectivist metaphysics is covered in the present chapter on reality. Epistemology is the branch that studies the nature and means of human knowledge, chapters two through five. These two branches make possible a view of the nature of man, chapter six. Flowing from the above are the three evaluative branches of philosophy. Ethics, the broadest of these, provides a code of values to guide human choices and actions, chapters seven through nine. Politics studies the nature of a social system and defines the proper functions of government, chapters 10 and 11. Aesthetic studies the nature of art and defines the standards by which an artwork should be judged, chapter 12. In presenting objectivism, I shall cover the five branches in essential terms, developing each in hierarchical order and offering the validation of each principle or theory when I first explain it. The true capital T said Hegel is the whole, capital W. At the end of our discussion, to borrow these terms, you will see a unique whole, the whole which is Ayn Rand's philosophic achievement. You may then judge for yourself whether it is an important achievement and whether it is true, capital T. And that's it. And I just have a sequence break and go right into every philosophy, you know, start somewhere, where does one start? So I think that in a brief way, so far as, you know, one can do that, in a few pages, uh, establishes some kind of motivation. You can't convince someone you know, of uh, the indispensability of philosophy by simply stating it, but you can at least, as they say, show him where you're coming from, give him an overall orientation, define the branches, and plunge in. So that's my groundbreaker. All right, let's turn now to the sequence entitled Existence as Possessing Primacy Over Consciousness. But first, I had one written question. Now, I hesitate to answer this because I don't want written questions, because as soon as I say I'll take written questions, I get huge cardboard cartons stuffed full of them. And there's simply no time. It's in physically impossible. So. I'm making an exception here. I don't want to encourage written questions. And this is a pretty um, technical question. But since you could mis misunderstand something I said yesterday, I want to cover it. It amounts to, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's too complex, but I made a distinction between the logical order of the axioms and the chronological order in which we become aware of it. And that uh, confused the person who took it a certain way and confused them for a good reason. I'm not going to give the whole reason why it confused them, but I want to amend or clarify something. In the strict sense, there is no logical order to axioms. So if I said, 
uh, and I did say in passing, the logical order versus the chronological order, that is inaccurate formulation. You tell me why there can't be an order to axioms. Yes. Yes, ex axioms are simultaneous. If one were derivative from another, it wouldn't be an axiom. An axiom has to be a primary. And primary is just Latin for starting point. That is where you begin. And consequently, you can't have a graded set of axioms. You can't have a chronological order. But you can't have, uh, and obviously, for instance, it would make no sense to say identity is logically dependent on existence. Now, in a loose manner of speaking, you can say there can't be something unless it is. But in actual fact, as you know, existence is identity. You can't make uh, a sharp line and say, first there is something, now let's have coffee, now come back, now the next thing is the something is something. See, it's not, it's not a derivative from the first. So strictly speaking, uh, they're all implicit in your grasp of the first one, even consciousness is right there at the outset as you grasp the first one. So in what sense did I say there was an order that's different from the chronological order? It's, perhaps it's better to say not a logical order, but an order of exposition. After all, if there were 10 axioms, you still can't blurt them all out in the same instant. So do you just throw them up in the air and take whichever comes first? You try to have an order that makes sense simply of stating consecutively what, in fact, in logic is simultaneous. And there, I think, is obvious there has to be something. And remember, we're defining, a so existence is the first. We're defining axioms to ground human cognition. So the faculty of cognition has to be there. As soon as there's something, we know it. And then, simply, the law that covers everything. It's from that point of view that I made the distinction between the so-called logical and the chronological, but I'm glad that this was pointed out because strictly there is no order to axioms. On the other hand, you see, causality is definitely a higher level. That is something that is not, you couldn't put in there as simultaneous because it is an application of identity to a specific uh, uh, category of action. And therefore, that's something that has, is a derivative or the primacy of existence is, as we saw, a derivative of causality. Now, all of the primacy of, exi of existence is an axiom in the sense that you can't prove it, and all discourse depends on it. But it is a, clearly a derivative which you can reduce back to causality, which you can reduce back to identity. It's not what we call the basic axiom. And in that sense, there's a logical hierarchy. You, I couldn't have started by saying, let's have uh, four axioms, existence, consciousness, identity, and the primacy of existence. That would be definitely out of sequence. Logic. OK, I hope that clarifies that. I know who asked this, although it's an unsigned question. And I don't recognize the handwriting, but there's only one question. This was a woman that asked this, right? Just say yes. <laughs> no, because I, I know who it was. OK, let's take uh, now on. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not saying that in a pejorative way. What? Did oh, you no. ask that, Gary? No, no, fine. I was just saying, how do you know? Because I thought perhaps you were a little uncertain. Oh, it was you? Oh, no, it wasn't. Oh, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> All right. Let's go to um, uh, this sequence now. Now, I just want to point out as a start on page 22 that in the same manner in which I treated causality, I'm treating this, in other words, observational inductive approach. We start with what we observe. I don't start with a deductive argument from the nature of existence and the nature of consciousness, because this is something we grasp in the act of grasping consciousness. It's a purse. Remember, all of these primary truths of philosophy have to go back to perceptual data. Therefore, in presenting them, you should present the kind of perceptual experience that would lead someone, lead the child, to grasp these implicitly. So instead of some kind of theoretical, rationalistic deduction from the nature of existence and consciousness, let's go to what's actually given us. So I say, for instance, in paragraph 2 on page 22, 
From the outset, consciousness presents itself. In other words, you experience it as, you perceive it as something specific. And that, for instance, this is the way that it comes. The child doesn't like the food, it refuses to look at it, but it's still there. Now that is the whole primacy of existence. I mean, that's the kind of experience which we then conceptualize in the form of the primacy of existence. You can't will the food out of existence. You can't uh, evade it out of existence. You can't wish it out of existence, nor into existence for that matter. And your understanding of all these principles will be much clearer if you always carry in your mind a series of elementary perceptual experiences to which you can reduce it. If you're thinking of causality, you should not be thinking in the rationalist model. An entity has a nature. That's the abstract summary. You should be thinking of the ball can't be made uh, uh, to, um, will roll if you push it, but the block won't. Remember the examples I used. And the same is here. If you're thinking of the primacy of existence, you have to think of something like the child trying to will the food out of existence and it won't go. Those are the perceptual data which we then put in abstract terms and give a philosophic formulation to, but you have to bring them all back to that kind of direct experience. All right, let's take some questions from you on this before I go further. Now, you're going to give us approximately half an hour? OK. Now, we're going to try one apiece. Yes? The project of axioms. Oh, you want to go back to axioms? OK. So, yes. Um, yeah. On page 11, second to the left. Oh. All right, I'll take this, but I would like to try to get some on the sequence. Everybody goes before or after rather than on the sequence. Can you try to keep your questions here after within the sequence? Did you hear what I said? Miss? I'm, I like No, it's done. How do you reconcile these two statements? I haven't any idea what's not reconcilable about them. I have no idea what the relation is. One is. Yes, the first one. Yeah, you don't have to repeat it. You're not listening to me. You're just talking. The first is a statement that says an axiom is at the base of knowledge, and every other statement rests on it. What, why is there a problem reconciling that with causality as independent of consciousness? Causality is not. A, yes. So. So uh, I'm referring to the axiom of consciousness. It should be contained. Well, I'm sorry. Knowledge. I'll have to cut this question off because you are off the track completely. This is not of general interest. I'm sorry. Please sit down. I will try to make one brief comment to you, and that's all I can do because I'm not going to go back and forth for 20 minutes. You misunderstood this statement thoroughly, but so thoroughly that I can't spend very much time on it. An axiom, all, every statement you make on any subject presupposes the axiom. If I say the cat is on the mat, the axiom relies on it. If I say the theory of uh, the axiom is contained in it, you couldn't say that unless there was something, unless it was what it was, and unless you were able to be aware. And that's true of the cat on the mat. It's true of the theory of relativity. It's true of the th principle of causality. It's true of every fact, every statement, anything you can dream of or imagine. If you can utter it, even if it's false, it relies on the axioms. That's entirely independent of whether a fact is, exists or whether it's independent of consciousness. So I don't know what confusion you're, you're involved in, but I can't go with it any further right now. Can I have another question? Yes, at the back. Can't hear you. On page 19. 19. I'm still not on the right section. Yes. You say that eternal entities don't need to cause, and you get the example of the universe as a whole. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. 
And the example of the universe as a whole. Yeah. As an eternal entity. Right. That uh, does not need a cause. Right. Um, my question is, therefore, the subjectivism state that the universe um, has always existed. No. Because the, the objectivism... You're, you're not really on the track here. That's not really a, essential to what we're talking about. But you want to get me into cosmology. Uh, um, objectivism does not say the universe always existed, if you mean by always a temporal concept, because the universe is not in time. Time is in the universe. Time is a relationship, a measure of motion that you have to do within a certain uh, frame of reference. Uh, you can't apply. Uh, anything such as time or space to the universe as a total. That's exactly why we have the word eternal, which means out of time. It's not synonymous with everlasting. But that is not a significant question, I'm sorry to say. Uh, maybe I'm being overly gruff this morning because I've rejected two questions out of hand. But I really want to get questions starting on page 22 that pertain to the primacy of existence. I have to be more or less cavalier here. I know that these questions are important to those who ask. I don't mean to put you down, but I have hundreds of people and thousands of questions on the topic. I just can't take the ones that I regard as off. At the end, we'll have a sort of a mop-up phase. Now, it probably intimidated everybody. Yes? Um, this is a question about the primacy of consciousness position. Good, yeah. <laughs> I think it also relates to the clarification you gave a minute ago about the axioms being logically simultaneous, but I won't. Related to that, you can watch <laughs> Okay. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there a sense in which, within a primacy of consciousness viewpoint, the very concepts consciousness and knowledge and truth have the status of stolen concepts precisely because, for instance, consciousness is not being used to, to denote grasp of an independent existence, because they're, they're denying... Are you it. saying from my point of view or from their point of view? Would, would, would we... Would it be oh, a yes. criticism yeah. of their view to oh, say absolutely. that yeah. they deny existence, consciousness, knowledge, yes. truth... Uh, would it, would uh, the primacy... Your question comes down to this. Would the primacy of consciousness be a stolen concept? Uh, or involve stolen concepts? Yes, all concepts are stolen. Uh, on the primacy of consciousness. Because the primacy of consciousness says, is, is as, I, as I indicated, a denial of the axioms. It denies existence. It wants to have existence and eat it too. It therefore denies consciousness, which is only the faculty of perceiving existence. It says we can do to things whatever we choose. Therefore, identity is not an absolute. Things don't have to be what they are or act accordingly. So it therefore repudiates all of the axioms. Well, given what we said earlier, that every statement rests on those axioms. If you repudiate all the axioms, you can't have any viewpoint. You can't talk about anything. You can't make any statements. You can't use any concepts. So if you accepted the primacy of consciousness, you would have to close your mouth completely. But that's just another way of saying if you reject all the axioms, you're nowhere. I wonder if that doesn't indicate a, a certain logical dependence of the concept of consciousness on existence, since what they're saying is I reject no, I don't think in the sense that, you, that that is relevant here. Obviously, consciousness is dependent on existence in the sense that if there was no, uh, nothing to be aware of, there could be no awareness of it. But that is not the same as the question when you're starting off a, a philosophy and you want to state the principles on which your adult cognition depends. You simultaneously say, if you notice the way Ayn Rand said, I'm going to give her the... Last word here, from memory. Existence exists. And the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms, that something exists which one perceives, and then one exists possessing consciousness. Consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists, unquote. Now, in the very initial statement, the two come together, come simultaneously. That is no implication that consciousness could exist apart from existence. Uh, obviously, existence has to be there. And existence could exist without any consciousness. But it doesn't alter the fact that if we're laying the foundations of knowledge, you can't talk about knowledge without a faculty of knowledge. And that has to be there 
as soon as you open your mouth. OK. Yes? Um. Right. Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused because obviously you have to have facts from extrospection in order to get, uh, in order to think about, but don't you actually get knowledge from introspection also? Yes, but uh, don't, the, 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 quoting the sentence on the bottom of 25, if existence is independent of consciousness, the knowledge of existence can be gained only in one way, by extrospection, by looking outwards. And you say to me, don't you gain knowledge by introspection? Now, what is the answer that I deliberately try to cover by putting two words into that sentence? If I had said, if existence is independent of consciousness, then knowledge can be gained in only one way, obviously that would have been wide open to, well, how about introspective knowledge? But I'm not talking about knowledge of consciousness. What you gain by introspection is knowledge of consciousness. Knowledge of your own mental contents, of your own processes, of your memories, of what's the inner world. I'm talking about knowledge of existence, of what's out there in this context, a knowledge of, of what you point to. You cannot get, and the crucial point here is you cannot get knowledge of the world by looking inward. You cannot. But don't you have to take the facts and then digest them? Now, excuse me. Digesting the facts is not introspective. Thinking is not introspective. Perceiving is not introspective. Using your consciousness is not studying your consciousness. Looking out and using your faculty to look out is not looking in. And you are making, you see the equivocation? You got that now? Yeah, OK. But don't, don't assume that every time the word consciousness is involved, you are looking in at consciousness. Most of the time, you're not. Introspection is a very specialized activity. You have to sit down and say, OK. It's exactly like you know, looking at Professor Bigner as a specialized activity. Most of the time, you don't do it. And if you, want, <laughs> if you want to, you have to turn your head, make a, a definite effort of focus, turn your cognitive faculty over there, gear up, and say, OK, there it is. Now, what do I want to study about him or know about him? What shirt is he wearing? What mood is he in, etc." cetera? Uh, the same is true of consciousness. Using it is not the same as studying it. If you want to know something about consciousness, you have to introspect by a specific deliberate effort. But nevertheless, uh, I'm glad if I could clarify that. This happens to be a, a new and important passage here, so let me comment on this on the bottom of 25 and through uh, 26. Because this is the key epistemological implication of the primacy of existence. And it's all contained in the sentence. Um, in, the, in this approach, that is the primacy of existence, the very bottom of 25, nothing is relevant to cognition of the world except data drawn from the world. And then I go on right there to say introspection is necessary as a means to grasp the processes of consciousness, but it is, this is my best formulation. Introspection is not a means of external cognition. You cannot find out about the outside world by any data drawn from the inside. And that is the crucial thing that distinguishes the objectivist epistemology from all of forms of rationalism uh, throughout history or of mysticism. The, the key to mysticism is the attempt to look inward and find something within consciousness which will tell you about reality where you can bypass reality. You don't have to look at reality. You can look to the something within consciousness. Now, for instance, you can look to an innate idea. You don't have to, the rationalist said, you don't have to study reality. You just take an inventory of the truths that God has placed in your mind. And then you make deductions from there. That's an example of introspection as a means of external cognition. Plato or whatever wants to know something about the external world. And his way of doing it is to try to dredge out what's in his consciousness. Kant is a different kind of example. He doesn't believe in innate ideas, but he believes there's an innate structure. Our mind is built in a certain way. And if we want to know whether causality obtains in the world, he said, we'll never know it by studying the world. 
The only way we can know that causality ob obtains is how? By looking in and finding this little filter in our consciousness, which guarantees that everything is going to be causal. And again, knowledge of the external is de de uh, achieved by studying the internal. Now, mysticism is just another form of that. You're studying, in this case, the effects of God on your consciousness, the revelations, etc. Uh, when we say that feelings are not tools of cognition, the deepest reason for that is that feelings are simply, as such, events in consciousness. And nothing on the inside is, is a means of knowing the outside. The only way you can know the outside is to look outside. Because you use your consciousness in the process, but that doesn't mean you turn in. You turn out. And that is the whole essence of what going by reason uh, consists of. Using your uh, consciousness to come to conclusions only on the basis of what you observe outside. And always keeping a firm line uh, between the two. Now, on the primacy of consciousness view, it goes in exact reverse. Because there, since consciousness controls existence, since existence is not independent, there's no reason that you have to look outside. You could just look in, grasp uh, you know, your feeling, or God's feeling, or society's feeling, whatever happens to be controlling, and say re reality will snap into line, will take care of itself. So on that view, introspection is a means of external cognition, as in Kant is the arch uh, example. But that is exactly what the whole objectivist epistemology rejects, and that's the deepest metaphysical reason behind our rejection of mysticism, of any form of emotionalism, subjectivism, that, that uh, using uh, feeling or desire as a tool of cognition. You had a question on that back there, yes. Um, I'd like to know if, uh, would observing a hunger pang be an example of intro or extrospection? Experiencing a hunger pang is just an experience. If you focus inwardly on it, then you are introspecting your sensation. And that is, if you try to say to yourself, let me see, is this sharp? Is it faint? Is it lasting a long time or a short time? Is it on my right side or my left side? You are trying to name a sensation in your consciousness. You're studying it. But if you're just you know, minding your business, you know, living your life and you get a sharp pain, as such, you're not engaged in any cognition. You're just having an experience. Experience, per se, is, in that case, is just an experience of your body. And you could call it a form of perception in that it's a, a form of sensing the state of your body. But introspection is when you study something, when you turn in and look at it, try to come to some cognitive conclusion. A dream, for instance, is not as such introspection. It's just a series of images going past your mind. Who else? Yes. Twenty-seven. That's right where I am. Okay. Primacy of existence. Yes. Yeah. With a rare exception, what's the philosophy that fit into the absence? What are the exceptions to the primacy of consciousness in Western philosophy? The main exception is Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle's philosophy was essentially the primacy of existence. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to formulate the uh, primacy of existence for a number of reasons. Not the least of which was that the concept of consciousness had not even been formulated at that time. The Greeks, you know, had concepts of the various processes of consciousness, like thinking, sensing, dreaming, and so on. But they had no concept for consciousness as such, for awareness as such. And therefore, many of the crucial philosophic principles, even if their heart was in the right place, they were unable uh, to formulate them. So uh, Aristotle did in fact, even contradict the primacy of consciousness sometimes. As, I mean, the primacy of existence, as in his prime mover, you know, thought thinking about itself, which is like, is tantamount to pure consciousness detached from uh, uh, existence, uh, which is his platonic remnant. So there is some elements of that in Aristotle, but 
primarily, Aristotle was uh, primacy of existence. The rest of philosophy uh, has almost all been primacy of consciousness. And the main versions, as I indicated, are Plato, Kant, and then all the moderns. All, all other primacy of existence? Well, he's the only major one. It's just his followers, then. Yes? Page 26 of the lower paragraph. Yes. Yeah. You're discussing primacy of consciousness. Are you taking the three different views in respect to creating existence, controlling it, or just uh, perceiving it by a non-sensory means? Are they all tied into one? They're all tied into one. Uh, the primacy of consciousness means the view that consciousness comes first. It is the creator of reality. If it's the creator of reality, then obviously it would be the sustainer of reality. It keeps things in, it keeps it in existence. And if it is the primary that controls and sustains and that reality just follows it, then you don't have to look uh, uh, outward to know reality. You just have to look at consciousness. The epistemology follows from the metaphysics. But the essence of the primacy of consciousness is the primacy of consciousness. Consciousness comes first. It is the axiom, the, the root, the, the fundamental, and existence is just a derivative of it. All those other things that you mentioned are simply different formulations, different consequences of that primary. Yes, Sylvia. Is this your first or second? Pardon me? Is this your first or second? First. OK. Page 27, the fifth sentence down, uh, you Do, say. Uh, Do it by paragraph. First paragraph. The, uh, yeah. On that sentence, you say, in essence, what we've been offered is a variety of attempts to construe existence as a subordinate and malleable realm. Malleable, yeah. Uh, why? Why is it that men have tried to do that to subordinate existence? Well, you're asking me a psychological question, which I'm trying to set at the outset, I'm trying to avoid. Why has the primacy of consciousness been so prevalent? Uh, actually, the answer is philosophic. And I've already given it in the book. And it comes down to the theory of concept formation. So uh, let's leave it till we get there. You'll, but you know from the false theories of concept formation, you cannot have the primacy of existence view if you're going to hold that concepts are supernatural or uh, internal and subjective. Uh, because then reality becomes a product of concepts. That's what it comes down to either supernatural or social. So you end up with the primacy of consciousness. So the real, the real issue of the primacy of existence is the issue of concept formation. So you'd have to reformulate your question, why did nobody come up with a valid theory of concepts? And I don't know that that is a legitimate question, because it's, uh, somebody has to discover things for the first time. Aristotle did a heroic job within his, uh, you know, within what you could expect at that stage. And he made Ayn Rand and, and later theories, later developments possible. But I don't think it's legitimate to look at the history of philosophy or the history of anything and say, great achievement A took place in 1812 or 1604. Why not up 10,000 or 2,000 years earlier? There's a certain element of free will and of the human intelligence. And there's no guarantee as to when we're going to discover various things. You could make a case that if Ayn Rand had been born in ancient Greece, the generation after Aristotle, I'll give her, let's say, a couple of generations to digest what he said, a century, the whole of Western history would be different. But I mean, we're just playing games to make up these constructs because it didn't happen that way. And, and I, I really I have no answers. I don't think there's any magic answer to why didn't these things happen, because however much it's going to come back down to, at a certain point, somebody did not discover something. I don't think it was. Everybody was simply rotten through and through. I don't think that's the explanation. I think it's, there was some dishonesty on the part of some philosophers, but I think there was a real gap in crucial knowledge. And I think that we're better off than they were uh, as a result. Yes. Well, I'm have you asked yet? OK, good. Consciousness is only the faculty of awareness. Yeah. Uh, how and where does creativity come into this? Or am I jumping ahead too far? No, that's OK. 
consciousness, if consciousness is only the faculty of awareness, how does creativity come into it? Well, creativity does not come into it. If you mean creativity in the sense of creating something out of nothing, that's exactly what the primacy of, uh, of existence denies. In that sense, in the way in which God is supposed to be creative, you know, he sits down and says, let there be a world, and the world comes, there is no creativity. But creativity in the legitimate sense, you know, we think up a, a novel, or you create a way to uh, uh, design your room, or you create a new wardrobe. All of that is simply, a, in fact, I even quote from this round on that, is simply a rearrangement of existing elements. That's consciousness's whole power to create is simply to take what's there and put it into a different organization, a different pattern. That's all it is. Uh, the, the, the greatest novel has to ultimately consist of concrete, th reduced back to perception only. You think of combinations, men doing things and so on, that, uh, that uh, haven't occurred as you've observed. And the same is true of any color combinations, uh, any sound combinations, etc. And in fact, I quote from Ms. Rand on that on the top of 34. Creativity is merely the power to rearrange the combinations of natural elements. Creation does not mean the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. It means the power to bring into existence an arrangement that hadn't existed before. Is that unclear or clear? OK. Back, if you can yell that loud. Okay. okay. I told us yesterday that you tried to eliminate employment as much as possible. Right. And I wondered in this section, I see that you spent half of it on those three versions of the Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. Why did I include the three forms of the primacy of consciousness if I want to eliminate polemics? And my reason here was not polemics, but simply to clarify the actual full range of what is meant by the primacy of existence. I did not think it would be entirely clear if I, I debated putting these three, you know, the three versions of it at the end under um, the polemics. But what I really wanted to get to was the idea that I'm talking more broadly than simply any individual's consciousness or even than human consciousness. I'm talking about the category of consciousness as such. This includes animal, vegetable, mineral, divine, or any other category that you have in mind. And I thought the most unique way of showing what, uh, uh, the best way of showing what's unique about objectivism is to show that the, what, what we reject by saying the primacy of existence is the totality of attempts to drown existence in consciousness. And those have three main forms, in your own consciousness, in the consciousness of a group, in the consciousness of some supernatural being. And it's for that reason that I decided to put right here, when I say the primacy of existence, you always have to contrast, in some sense, what you're for as against what you're against. But it's so abstract here that I thought the best way is to to me, there is something inimitably clear about saying the same argument that refutes a subjectivist refutes a religionist. It's the same principle. And you have to, therefore, combine the two together to get the full range. Now, you see, where I summarize that is on page 30, uh, where I cash in on this uh, conclusion. In paragraph 3, we're going to count the little fragment at the top as a, a paragraph. Yeah, it's that paragraph. In regard to fundamentals, it makes no difference whether one construes existence as subservient to the consciousness of God, of men, or of oneself. All these represent the same metaphysics with the same error, and we reject them all on the same ground. So that is the key point. That we don't have one argument against religion, and one argument against subjectivism, and one argument against socialism. All of them is the same thing, and it all comes back to existence exists. And it was precisely to bring that out that I put these various um, uh, examples of the primacy of consciousness into this section. All right, we are um, turning.
turning now to the metaphysically given as absolute. And this is, <clears throat> in a way, the climax of the um, chapter, the, the final metaphysical implication. And it dots the eye of the, on the primacy of existence. If existence is what it is independent of consciousness, that means we have to adapt to it. We cannot change what is inherent in existence as such. If it's part of existence, it is immutable, unalterable, absolute. And absolute I define here as necessitated by the nature of existence and therefore unchangeable by any human or any other agency. Part of the fabric of that which is. The metaphysically given, of course, is to be contrasted with the man-made. Now, of course, man is metaphysically given. He's, he's here as a fact. But what he does is governed by the faculty of choice. And as such, it did not have to be that way. It's not part of the nature of reality. So it's not an absolute. Uh, this is the crucial point that we're developing here. And before we turn to questions, there's one thing I want to clarify um, that you may be confused about or may even find helpful. On page 34, and this is a question I get all the time. I'm even debating a footnote on this, but I'd just be curious to know whether this bothers you. Uh, on the last main paragraph on 34, Metaphysically given is reality. You see that? As such, it is not subject to anyone's appraisal. It must be accepted without evaluation. Uh, fact of reality, you can't say great or terrible. Uh, don't greet it by tribute or condemnation, praise or blame. That's, of course, the objective of view. That's the foundation of all value judgments, reality. But reality as such simply is. But now I'm constantly asked this type of question, I mean by students or not necessarily people who read the book, but presenting this type of point. Well, what about tidal waves? I even think of this as the tidal wave objection. Now, a tidal wave is um, uh, a fact of reality. It's certainly not man-made. And yet, aren't you entirely justified in saying this is bad? This is no good. Uh, and isn't that an evaluation? And doesn't that therefore contradict Ayn Rand's key point that evaluations are applicable only to the uh, man-made, not to the metaphysical? Now, I hope we can grasp that tidal wave stands for earthquakes and plagues and <laughs> bad winds. And you know, there's no use changing the example. Let's stick with the title. I mean, if you don't like it, it can be another one. But it's not a trick example. They all. <laughs> now, what do you say about that? Do you see what the question is? All right, who has an answer to that one? Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. Well, I don't think I can get out of it entirely by just by the word greeted, because I said it must be accepted without evaluation. And here, I'm evaluating it. So on the face of it, I'm, I'm engaged in a contradiction. I'm, I'm not doing this in order to you know, cause trouble as an enemy itself. But from my experience, you are going to get this type of question, and therefore, the more you exercise your mind and try to figure it out, the more you'll be on your own later. I think there's a couple of crucial points here, but let's see what you come up with. Yes. The waiver. Yeah. With respect to the existence, you're not evaluating that per se. Right. You're evaluating its relationship to man's. Well, excellent. Very excellently put. You are not, that is really, you could uh, put that in a footnote that way. You are not evaluating its existence. You are not saying reality is corrupt for having a tidal wave. You can't say, I blame reality. Look at the words. Uh, or I condemn it for having a tidal wave. Nor, on the other hand, can you say, I praise uh, reality. 
and paid tribute to it because the sea is smooth. The sheer fact's existence as such, it just is. What you can do, however, is identify its relation to a specific human goal. You can say, given this fact, which I don't in itself evaluate, it has a certain effect on my goal. And given that I evaluate my goal as good, this fact is bad for the goal. That doesn't mean the fact is bad in itself. It's an equivocation. It's just like saying if you have, uh, you're have you washing on the line and you want it to get dry and the rain comes, it's a, a child would say the rain is bad. It's a wicked. Now, that's the sense in which you cannot evaluate rain. It's a fact. But a, a, a rational uh, person can certainly say the rain is bad for my clothes. That is an evaluation that is not, uh, in any way, the child is stamping your foot at reality. It's not evaluating a metaphysical fact. It's simply identifying its effect on a human goal. And in that sense, we have to identify, I refer you to my article on fact and value, we have to ultimately identify the effect on our goals of every fact. So in that sense, every fact is open to evaluation. Not evaluation in the sense of evaluating reality, but evaluation in the sense of pointing out the effects on our actions. But now another crucial implication here. Even this type of evaluation is appropriate only, only when the, when the fact falls within the sphere of human action, when there's something that you can do to alter the, effect, the fact, when you can take some action to change things and save your goal. When it's outside the sphere of action, even that uh, secondary evaluation is inappropriate. For instance, you can say, the rain is bad for my clothes. And what can you do about that? Cover them up. Take them off the line. See, there's something you can do. You can say, the tidal wave is bad. What can you do? You can't stop the tidal wave, but you can certainly do what? Run away from it. Get the hell out of there. But on the other hand, suppose someone argued like this. The law of gravity is bad. It's bad for my diet. <laughs> because you know, if there weren't a law of gravity, or if gravity was you know, proportional to the, uh, uh, let's say, the fourth power instead of the square, I would weigh much less than I could pass Weight Watchers. <laughs> Therefore, it's, you know, gravity is bad for my diet. Now, you could not, that would be exactly a case of trying to evaluate a metaphysical fact. That is outside the power of human action. That simply is, and that is exactly the where you have to say it must be accepted without evaluation. This doesn't mean you have to have a party and celebration of gravity. That would also be a mistake. It simply means it's the given. If you have any goal that, can't, that this conflicts with, what is the moral to draw? Your goal is wrong. Not do something about the fact, but drop your goal or amend it accordingly. The fact as such cannot be challenged, questioned, or evaluated. I hope that uh, covers you. Now, take death as one more example. Can you evaluate death? The fact of death. Now, many people say death is a tragic thing. Death is uh, you know, a terrible thing. Now, it entirely depends what you mean by that. In one sense, you can evaluate a person who's dying as bad. In what form or in what context? Only when you imply this is something, this was a death outside the norm that somehow, if we'd known enough, we could have prevented. You have to tie it into the potential of human action and change. For instance, if, if you die when you're 15 through a disease or an accident, that someday we'll be able to cure. We say, what a tragic thing, what a bad thing. And the implication is, given our goal, this is undesirable. We didn't know how to take the action, but we're judging it as someday we would like to be able to take this action. And then it still falls under the rain category. But in the normal context now, not speaking of a, you know, an exceptional death uh, through some uh, abnormal circumstance, but a man reaches a ripe old age, he reaches the normal 
lifespan. We have no reason to believe that can be prolonged any further. And it just gradually fades away and dies. You cannot say that's a bad thing. According to this principle, a fact of reality has to be accepted without evaluation. That comes like then the principle of the law of uh, uh, gravity. It's inherent in a living thing by everything we know, and in the nature of life, in the nature of uh, the Earth. And that being the case, you just have to accept it, neither wistfully nor joyously, but simply that's it, and there's nothing that can be done about it. And consequently, there should be no, uh, uh, no negative evaluation. Of course, you can mourn. You can miss a person. Uh, you wish, uh, you know, you could have all those experiences, but that's not the same as an evaluation if it's in the, uh, the uh, uh, truly is in the normal course of affairs. You can't stamp your foot against uh, reality. That's what's meant by the metaphysically given is reality. Can you attempt to prolong life? Certainly. And we've done a great uh, job. I mean, the human race has, uh, judging from the medieval period to the uh, uh, longevity today, is way ahead of it. And I am not in a position to say how much you can prolong it. So we have to just go on the basis of the knowledge available. All I'm saying is, by everything we know, there is some lifespan beyond which you can't. Otherwise, you would be immortal. We have no basis for that. That's what's meant by the fact of death as such at some point. Now, if you're at a stage where people are living to 70 or 80, and somebody dies at 50, you can say, we sh you know, it's too bad, because we could have done more. But if somebody is now 90, and they, I take that as an example, because I know people who are 90. And they, the ones I know have a very rational attitude. They've come to the end. Uh, they have no more time available. They're, they're losing their faculties, which is a nice thing on the part of reality, because it, you, you don't sit there with all the strength and everything, and then you're suddenly cut down. You gradually lose your ability in the normal course to do anything, and then you accept death with equanimity. Uh, and at that age, at that point, it would be ridiculous to say, uh, I'm miserable and I'm dying because five centuries from now, the life expectancy will be 125. It isn't five centuries from now, and that's a fact of reality. So therefore, you have to live with that. Now, anything on the tidal wave? Yes. Uh, if a small infant is reaching for a, a stove burner or something like that, trying to increase his sensory field, uh, would you say that that child, in reality, that's something that you can't alter? And you can't say that's bad? That's You're bad. asking me a question. Does a small infant have volition? You give the example of reaching for a stove. I don't think an infant has volition, no. Uh, Ayn Rand used to speculate on whether animals and infants had any rudimentary or very primitive form of choice. But it would certainly not be choice in anything like the way that I define in the chapter, in the section on volition. It certainly isn't the choice to focus or not or to think or not. And what it would be is a matter of sheer speculation. Practically speaking, by everything we know, infants like animals are simply determined. They react to their uh, sensations and then their percepts. Choice doesn't begin until the conceptual uh, level. So you, uh, you said, can you say it's bad? It's certainly bad for him to touch the stove because he'll burn himself. The action is bad in the sense that it hurts him. But that doesn't make him bad, because he didn't know what he was doing. You can't condemn him for taking the action. There is such a thing as a mistaken uh, uh, action, which uh, is honestly mistaken. The child is not to blame, but the action is still bad. Does that answer? OK. Who else? Yes. There's an issue here that I'm not entirely clear about in that it, I, I see two different things in the way it's cause and effect. One is uh, you could evaluate both the tidal wave and the dictatorship as being harmful to human life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that if, in fact, they, they exist, then you evaluate them dispassionately as being facts. They do exist metaphysically. But it's the cause that you would evaluate differently the cause and the status. You're asking me to compare a tidal wave and a dictatorship. Well, I'm saying that 
you, there's two modes of evaluation. Evaluating, you can evaluate the effect of both the tidal wave and but the Yes, current, and you can do current. more than the effect. You can evaluate the effect of a tidal wave as being against life or your life and the effect of a dictatorship. But a dictatorship is, you can evaluate on a much deeper level. Uh, uh, it's a different category of evaluation because a dictatorship, you say flat out, this phenomenon should never have existed. I condemn anything and everybody involved in its production. Corruption, evil, depravity, irrationality, you name it, was at the root of this uh, phenomenon. That's why it exists. It didn't have to, it shouldn't have, and I'm going to do everything I can to extirpate it and see that it never will again. Now, all of that is precisely what you can't say about a title. You can't, you can't say it shouldn't have. You can't say it shouldn't have because it was unavoidable. It's in the nature of things. That's just like saying the law of gravity shouldn't have. All you can say is, insofar as you could change a tidal wave, do it. But that doesn't mean you can say it shouldn't have existed, because to whom are you saying it? The waves aren't listening. Nobody, there's no God. So what is the meaning of the statement? Yeah. Well, I, I was, I think eventually it will be possible to stop tidal waves. Let's suppose that someday it would be possible to stop tidal waves. That does not make it legitimate to say it shouldn't have existed. It shouldn't have as a prescriptive statement, a excuse me, we can't go back and forth all the time. Uh, should and shouldn't are prescriptive uh, terms telling you how a thing ought to behave according to what code of values. And when you're talking about unconscious, non-volitional entities, it's simply inapplicable. You cannot apply such terms to them. I'll give you one last comeback, but we can go on forever. Yeah. I, I, I was just trying to make a point of distinction between saying any, any fact whatever, I mean, you, you can make the focus that any fact whatever could be treated just dispassionately as a fact. The dictatorship should never have existed, and that's analyzing, no, the, you, that's you're... analyzing the cause of it. But if it, if it exists now, as they exist in Eastern Europe, and they're, and they're attempting to get rid I understand of your point. You don't have to go. You, you're equivocating, though. I understand your point, but you are equivocating. You're de denying the whole distinction between the metaphysical and the man-made in the act of presenting. No, I, don't, I can't go back and forth anymore. You have to give me the last word now. Uh, when I say you have to accept a fact dispassionately, that does not include man-made facts. Does that mean, therefore, that you should evade facts or that you shouldn't acknowledge them? Certainly not. If a man-made fact exists, it exists. And the precondition of being able to change it is to know what it is. So obviously, it's a straw man to say you don't have to acknowledge a fact that involves human beings. But you acknowledge it in a crucially different way. You acknowledge metaphysical facts with the finality of existence exists. This is it. This is what I'm given. This is what I must conform to. Even when you change them, you have to conform to existence. Even when you change a tidal wave, you have to do it by conforming to the, to the nature of reality and its laws. And that's completely different from acknowledging a dictatorship in which when you acknowledge it, inherent in the acknowledgment is this is a human aberration. This is a, an evil that shouldn't have existed and that I'm going to see doesn't exist any further. Now, you do not try to bring those two together under one category, because all you're saying is they both are. I've already said what is is, but we're at a later point now that there's a big difference in is's between the metaphysical and the man-made. And you cannot obliterate that distinction by saying, oh, yeah, but after all, they both are. And you have to acknowledge it. I've acknowledged that in the axiom section. So you're just trying to take us back to a different department. Yes, at the very, there's a waiver in, in gray. Yeah. 37. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What did you have in mind by that parenthetical remark? <laughs> Good reading. Page 37. I said, but if living organisms are mortal, then within the relevant circumstances, they are so necessary. Why did I put within the relevant circumstances? 
because if I left that out, someone would come back and say, are you prepared to or prove that under all possible circumstances, living organisms are necessarily more? How do you know that someday there won't be a, uh, you know, a cure for mortality, a potion that you can take that'll make you cast iron and indestructible? Or you know, some form of advanced cryogenics, where if a person gets run over, you just take his various parts and substitute them from a refrigerator, and he's back in business again. <laughs> now, what I'm saying is this. Within the context that we now have, this is science. This is not a philosophy that living beings are more. And as I, when I discuss certainty, you say all certainty is contextual. It's within the context of the knowledge you already have. And so I'm making the point here that I'm not making this as a mystic absolute, that I've had a revelation, that none of these science fiction things are conceivable. All I'm saying is sticking to the knowledge that we now have. Within the circumstances as they now exist, living organisms are mortal. And I'm not making, I'm, am I saying those circumstances can be changed? No. I'm saying so long as those circumstances apply, they're going to be more. You say to me, what if the circumstances change? I say, I don't know. I can't speculate where I have no basis. Do you understand why I include that? OK. I'm trying to alternate, but they're all coming from the very back. OK, the very back. Page 33. 33, yeah. Second paragraph at the bottom. You have the statement, natural choice finds nature as natural as there have been other ones. The question is, is choice necessarily the only such act? For example, can physicists discover that the proton goes through one slit that might have gone through the other? Is that possible? Yes, no. That's the answer. Yes and no. <clears throat> But no, seriously, on page 33, an act of choice by its nature is an act which could have been otherwise. You want to know, is that the only kind of act which could have been otherwise? According to objectivism, yes. The example you cite of subatomic particles uh, taking alternate paths under the same circumstances is impossible according to the law of cause and effect. And objectivism rejects any theory of subatomic or superatomic motion that would involve anything other than a unique course of behavior given a given entity in a given set of circumstances. Entirely reject the indeterminacy in the inanimate or material world. Even in the animate world, as, you, as I say when we get to, in the, in the conscious world, when we get to volition, there is a sense in which even an act of choice could not have been otherwise. In what sense? In one sense. In what sense? When you choose, for instance, to focus or not, you couldn't avoid choosing. You know how the existentialists, for instance, that's yeah, before your time, but when I was there, there was a school called existentialism. And they used to go around bemoaning the fact that life was filled with choices. And they would say, if only we didn't have to choose. It's, you know, they would have the problem of going to restaurants, and you have to choose chicken or fish or steak. So all of life is this constant like a Chinese menu, you know, A meal or the B meal. Be a philosopher or be a surgeon. Go to class or go to the movie. Why is life continuous choice? And the fact is they couldn't avoid it. Choice was unavoidable. They, no matter what they did, they had to choose. And in that sense, choice is as inevitable as the motion of a subatomic particle. The only thing is that being choice it is a unique type of action. Choice means, and we, we'll get to that under volition, the selection of an, uh, among several alternatives which are, e which are possible under the circumstances. Therefore, the, a choice uh, to focus could have been the choice not to focus. The choice to have one thing could have been the choice not to have. If it's choice, it could have gone another way. But the sheer act itself, the contemplation of the alternatives and the decision one way or the other, that's unavoidable. In that sense, every event, even a choice, is uh, uh, unavoidable. Uh, but certainly, the objectivism rejects the idea of subatomic randomness or indeterminacy completely. I can't hear you. Push it one more step. Yeah. The photon, uh, the photon has to go through a slit. It's got to go through one or the other. I can't hear you. The photon has to go through one slit or the other. Yeah. 
Yes, but that doesn't make any difference. Everything has to do one thing or another. The question is, does it, can, it, can an unconscious entity do different things under the same conditions? And according to objectivism, it cannot. It has no, if, if it were capable, in fact, that, you're taking it back under causality. If the thing were capable of doing different actions under the same circumstances, it would be exactly like the balloon that you drop. It would have to either go up or down, but it could do either. That is not within the limits of the law of causality. If it had contradictory capacities, it would have to have contradictory elements in its nature that gave rise to those capacities under the same circumstance. And that would be a violation of identity. So photons are, uh, have no choice. They have an easy life. <laughs> yes? Page 31, 36, and 37. Wait a minute, 31? Yes? Yes. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on that? Like, well, the. I thought there was an epistemological principle saying that the mind can go astray, apart from reality. Well, the mind can go astray, but that doesn't alter the fact that you cannot conceive or imagine a fact at variance with the facts of reality. In the in the serious sense of imagine or conceive, if if you bear in mind identity, I said that. If you keep in mind the identity of all of the factors involved, and you know a fact, and leaving aside now the man-made, you could not imagine the opposite because you would be involved in a contradiction. And I gave you several examples in the text. Um, the the fact that you can visualize a picture, an image, contrary to a fact doesn't mean you can imagine it. All it means is you can drop your knowledge and make pictures for yourself. For instance, you can imagine a uh, block of ice on, uh, floating on a tub of water. And you can just imagine it suddenly plummeting to the bottom, even though it's a fact that ice floats on water. You can, you can just you know, imagine it. And Walt Disney can draw it. And you can actually see an animated cartoon. Does this mean, quote, it is imaginable that ice will sink in water? No. The fact that you can draw an image or a picture or form an image of it does not mean you can imagine it. Because what you can't do is imagine it keeping in mind a full context. Not just that this is a little gray shape on a big blue expanse, but that this is ice. That ice has a certain density, that it's a certain nature, that it's on water, that water has a certain density. If you keep all those facts, excuse me, when I get uh, involved, I can't speak. When you get, keep all those facts in mind, then the attempt to imagine ice sinking in water annihilates itself because it's a thing which cannot do something doing it. All you can imagine in the sense of an image is a little gray shape, a little gray rect uh, rectangle moving straight down through a big blue expanse. That is not imagining ice sinking in water. Not if you attach full meaning to the terms and keep in mind the facts. And all imagination, contrary to reality, consists of dropping the context that's already known. If you kept the full context, it would be the opposite of any fact is literally unimaginable if we're talking about metaphysical facts. And thus, my sentence, which I can point to on 38. Um, let see if I missed something here. Uh, the italicized one in the middle. Leaving aside the man-made, nothing is possible except what is actual. And that, I think, is a good summary of uh, the whole uh, metaphysical versus the man-made. If it is, it had to be. Now, of course, that does not apply to dictatorships or to the man-made, but it does apply to the metaphysical. I'm sure you had a question, didn't you? I, I must have pointed at you five times. No? All right, go ahead. I was wondering on page 39, where you talk about the, the thinker who rejects the absolutism of reality, why you did not mention the malevolent universe premise. Well, why didn't I mention the malevolent universe premise in connection with rejecting reality? 
Well, there's no necessary connection between them. Malevolent universe is a complex form of pessimism, which amounts to saying your values can't be achieved in the world. You're in a hostile world. Uh, first of all, that doesn't necessarily make you an evader. You may be just a miserable malevolent universe. You may honestly think that you're caught in, a, in an evil world through confusions, through errors. You, know, you don't know how to untangle it all. So that you're, you're mistaken if you hold that. But a mistaken view is not the same as a rejection of reality. If you arrive at your views by your best honest attempt, you're still, in the sense relevant here, conforming to reality even if you come to an error. And therefore, some malevolent universes are dishonest. And in some cases, their view represents a rejection of reality, you know, a defiance uh, of the whole universe. But that is not inherent. I know many perfectly honest people, in fact, who even know that malevolent universe is wrong, and they don't know how to shake it. It becomes a psychological problem. It's automatized in their subconscious circuits. So you cannot equate uh, malevolent universe with any, uh, uh, with what I'm talking about here, evading or rewriting facts. Let's take a simple example. <clears throat> Suppose I count the number of tables in this room. And I um, do it conscientiously, in focus. And I come up with, uh, let us say, 70. And the answer is really 68. I missed some. Or uh, I, I counted some twice. I have not evaded reality. I have not rewritten the facts of reality. I haven't done anything that would be relevant to coming into conflict with reality, holding a grudge against reality, or ending up with a mind-body dichotomy. All I've done is made a mistake. Now, you can't equate making a mistake with you know, attacking reality, because then nobody uh, can conform to reality. So we're talking about evading reality means refusing to look at something. If I come in and say, I don't feel like giving a lecture. There are no tables here, so there's no people, and that's it. Then I'm in conflict with reality. I'm just flat out asserting a wish, the primacy of consciousness, and to hell with the fact. You see what I'm saying? Then I'm evading reality, and then I'll right away come in conflict with reality. Because right away, I'll go to leave, and everyone will say, but there are tables here. We are. And then I'll have a grudge, you see. On the other hand, if I do it honestly, and I get 70 instead of 68, when I go to sit down on the 69th, I'll hit the ground. I'll say, oh, I see. I was wrong. So I pick myself up. I don't hold a grudge. I conform. I revise my view, and I go on. There's no problem. There's a, all the difference in the world between making a mistake, on the one hand, versus evading or rewriting reality. Making a mistake leaves you the means to correct it, and therefore does not cause all the problems we're talking about. Evading or rewriting reality puts you at enmity, at war with reality. And that is what causes the whole mind-body uh, dichotomy and the conflict and all the rest. Did you see that? So uh, you made a very important error there. If you take one uh, mistaken view and equate that with any form of rejecting reality, I, how did you get that? It was. Um... I mean, what made you think of malevolent universe in connection with this paragraph? Because that baffles me. He will view, view conflict with reality as being the essence of human life. Oh, I see what you got. Oh. And then if you put your question this way, now that I made that long speech, I finally get your point. <laughs> you mean the effect, not the cause. Oh, OK. Then the answer is yes. <laughs> anyway, that was a good clarification, even if it wasn't for you. No, his point apparently is once a person reaches this state of conflict with reality, won't he, as a consequence, necessarily be, have a malevolent universe viewpoint? Yes, I think he would. I think inherent in any form of the mind-body dichotomy of the inner versus the outer is the view that you're in an alien world, that your values can't be achieved. That is, that, that kind of pessimism is, is really another, is the emotional experience of being in conflict with reality. So, but it doesn't work the other way around. An honest person can be malevolent, but a dishonest one of this form will always be malevolent. Is that it? OK. I, I missed yeah. OK. Um, my wife wants to ask a question. Is that allowed? OK, yeah. 
I'm going to just do it briefly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, this has to do with the child uh, being talking about whether a child of five knows the difference between good and evil. child of five like ours. Yeah. <laughs> and I said I thought a child does. But you raised the issue of does the child really know the difference between the man-made and the metaphysical of that age? And isn't there is a difference between uh, knowing good and evil, being able to evaluate it, but being able to distinguish those principles? <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a whole complexity there. What, what I say about a child of five, whom I happen to be very familiar with, their ability to distinguish between the metaphysical and the man-made, yes, I think they definitely, in a civilized society. Now, in a savage society, they don't, they don't reach such a stage as the metaphysical versus the man-made because they think that everything is controlled by will. They think that there's little gods, for instance, animism, there's little gods in everything, and therefore that everything is subject to prayer, there is no what we would call metaphysical. Everything is the equivalent of man-made or volitional. But if we're talking about a modern scientific society, child of five has ample ability to understand what is necessary in his context or her context for uh, that distinction. That doesn't mean that they can philosophize about it. But uh, they certainly know the difference between, uh, for instance, mommy says no. And they would say, oh, please, can't I? Oh, just this once. Now, they, inherent in that, they know there's a way around this. This is not an absolute. <laughs> you said yes, but it could be otherwise. As against, they, wouldn't, they never say it to the stove when they burn their finger, please don't burn me. You know, they, they know that that's outside of anybody's control at a certain point. Now, the baby doesn't. But at a certain point, they know that Physical facts, nobody can do anything about. There's two of that uh, it rained, and that rain is bad. You know, oh, that, yes. That's what I'm trying at to an say. early stage, even at five, the distinction is not completely made. And they can grasp certain facts are unavoidable, but they still are very significantly colored by their desires. And therefore, if they don't like the rain, they can very easily say, this rain is bad. It shouldn't be. It spoiled my day. I wanted to play. And they can just, they can treat it very much there like you would treat a human action. That is the transition from what I was describing as the savage to what we describe as the adult. And even adults are capable of that. And the example of an adult being capable of that, you know, would be uh, you stub your toe and you kick the furniture. You give it a kick, you know, you're getting back at it. But the implication there is, you know, that's revenge on this thing for doing it. And there's all kinds of survivals of that where, you know, uh, even an adult can occasionally ascribe uh, uh, the man-made to the metaphysical. And certainly a child has not perfectly grasped it. But on some level, the basis is there to make it clear. Now let's go on to the last uh, sequence. And this is the polemical one. And I picked these two, idealism and materialism, because um, they are the two main metaphysical falsehoods. That is, from the point of view of an inventory of what exists, the two worst errors are to deny consciousness and deny existence. To say only consciousness exists, that's basically the idealist view. To say only uh, matter exists, or only existence, to deny consciousness, that's the materialist view. And that's why I picked those uh, two. And of course, objectivism is routinely confused with both of these. So it's important to distinguish. I had a professor who couldn't get out of his mind that objectivism were idealist because they believe everything is interconnected. And you want to know why did that lead to idealism? Because only idealists have held that view in history. Therefore, he just made up his mind that we must be idealists. Also, all mystical professors think that we're materialists because we don't believe in a supernatural consciousness. So uh, depending upon the type of professor you have, he will insist that this, no matter what you say, you're really an idealist, you're really a materialist. So I put this in for that kind of clarity clarification too. But this is deliberately polemics. 
Now, anything on this? Uh, yes. You do balance every time that um, you view a philosophy that contains an idealist or materialist element to draw the inference that, that the author of that philosophy rejects uh, some or all of the basic axioms. Like, for example, yes. you know, Aristotle's metaphysics contains within it an idealist element in the form of the prime mover. Yeah. Can we infer that Aristotle rejected all of the stuff no, you, if you see an idealistic element in somebody, using idealism in the technical sense, such as Aristotle's prime mover, a pure consciousness, does that mean he rejected all or some of the axes? No. All it means is he did not fully grasp all the implications of the axioms, which he couldn't have so far as there was any platonic elements in him. The axioms, remember, were to some extent implicit in his stage and had to be because he was the giant that gave us identity. And you know, uh, the human race grasped the three basic axioms many centuries apart from each other. Existence was grasped basically by Parmenides in terms of an explicit concept. Aristotle came you know, decades and decades later, and he grasped identity. And consciousness as a concept, as far as I can make out, was not grasped until Augustine which is way A.D. And so it was many centuries before the human race as a whole went through explicitly the sequence that we go through implicitly in the first months. Until those three axiomatic concepts are grasped explicitly, it would be impossible to adhere to all their implications consistently because it's simply too, too many different complex situations to apply them to. That's why you need the axioms and then the hierarchical development. Now, Aristotle grasped, let us say, the substance. He grasped A is A. But he didn't grasp every implication of that insofar as the relation of existence and consciousness is concerned. Nor could he have at that stage. So I wouldn't say he rejected it. I would just say he was, you know, his knowledge was contextual within the limits possible at that stage. But if your wider question is, is any time you see any error in somebody's philosophy, does that mean he's an enemy of the axioms? No. But on the other hand, if the, reject, if the error is not merely something grafted on you know, to a basically right direction, but is the germ, the essence, the motivation of the whole approach, then I would say he's either you know, simply a derivative mouthing somebody else, or if he's an originator, he is dishonest, like Kant. But it's really irrelevant to the, our concern whether these philosophers are honest or dishonest. We just want to know what's the arguments for or against the issues here. OK, who else has some? Well, I'll make it wide open now to anything on this chapter. Yes, because that'll be in our remaining time. Yes? Back to your issue of photon not having free will mm -hmm. and being essentially no. Uh, there's not much I really want to say about that. I don't want to go into the science of protons. So you have to formulate your question in metaphysical terms. Okay. I make a distinction between philosophy and science. So I don't want to know any experimental results. Okay, trust me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't trust you, but I'll give you, I'll give you a brief go, and that's all. You're being no greater than this earth. I can't hear you. What's that? I can't hear you. You're being no indeterminacy or randomness material level. Yet I have uh, free will resident in my material body. Okay, I'd like, to, I'd like to stop you right here. Believe me, I've heard this, and I, if I have it, I don't want to hear more. But let me put it to you this way. Randomness and indeterminacy have no application whatever to volition. We're going to discuss volition. Perhaps that will be clearer to you when we get to that. The concepts are simply inapplicable. There's nothing random, indeterminate, uncausal, chance, contingent, you name it. None of those terms are applicable to volition as objectivism construes it. What we have is a fact. It's a primary fact, so I cannot analyze it in terms of other facts. And it's not a mysterious fact because it is accessible to you by direct introspection. Now, here you have to introspect. All you have to do is the following experiment. You Right at this moment, make a choice. You 
decide to listen to me. Now, as I'm talking, make a deliberate choice to turn away and focus on something else, anything. And if you do that, then flick your attention back into focus and then flick it out. Whatever you are observing in the moment that you're doing it is a choice. There's no more to say about it. There's nothing more complicated. There's no way to explicate it in other terms. There's nothing random about it. The whole essence of it is it's a choice. It's something you did. You started. You controlled. It can't be reduced to anything else. And it can be, there's nothing uncausal about it. Uh, it's caused by your nature as a volitional being. You're a certain kind of being, therefore you have to choose, just as a, a, uh, a uh, piece of chalk has to fall. Uh, for further details, we'll discuss under volition. But all those terms are inapplicable, and I don't want to entertain them. Ran nothing is random in the metaphysical sense, contingent, chance, etc. Yes? Objectivism holds that uh, reality is the directly given. Uh, but right. certain British empiricists hold that your sensory experience is what you're directly given, because that's what you have to start with, to work with. How would you... Did you read chapter two? Uh, parts of it, yeah. <laughs> well, let me suggest that for, two, for uh, the next time you read chapter two, because that's directly covered in chapter two. So I want to save that. Uh, he wants to know, um, how do we know reality is directly given rather than just our experience of reality? How do you know we don't just perceive our experiences rather than reality? I cover that explicitly in chapter two, and I'm going to save that for now. Now, you want to talk about randomness, and I don't want to. Yes. Now, I control what I talk about up here. Yes. Page 17. 17? The last sentence. OK. Are you drawing a distinction there between what is directly observable and what is self-evident? And so what is the distinction? No. Self-evident is a, a logical term. That is, it tells you what the, the status of the thing is logically, how you validate. Observable tells you by what mechanism, by what means of knowledge you acquired it, or on what level. Is it perceptual or conceptual? Now, anything observable is self-evident, but those two terms are not synonymous. Observable means accessible to your faculty of observation, usually your eyes. Self-evident means, therefore, knowable simply by observation. No further evidence or argument is required. It's evident in and of itself. See what I'm saying? So that um, there is a distinction between the terms observable and self-evident. But anything that is observable in the literal sense, it's open to the power of perception. No proof is, is relevant then. Because all proof consists of reducing something back to perception. Therefore, as far as direct perception is concerned, is it's the self-evident. But that is not just a synonym. That is a way of classifying the logical status of anything given by perception. It itself is all the evidence you're going to have for it, because all other evidence consists of appealing to it. That's what we mean when we say it is self-evident. Yes? On page four, uh, you quote Ayn Rand, yeah. that which you claim to perceive does not exist, what you possess is not consciousness. Yeah. I know someone who. Uh, has Alzheimer's and went through a stage where they saw a whole phenomena that were entirely uh, non-existent. Could you reconcile that kind of phenomenon with this statement? Can I reconcile the phenomena of hallucinations with this statement of Ayn Rand? Oh, sure. If that which you claim to perceive does not exist, what you possess is not consciousness. First of all, she's speaking here on, the, on a metaphysical level in a metaphysical context. She's saying, there has to be something, and you have to have the faculty of being aware of it. If you tell me what you're aware of isn't there, it's nothing, then you have no faculty of awareness. There's no such thing as awareness of nothing. We're talking now on the basic level, coming from scratch. Is there something or not? Yes or no? Yes, then you have the faculty of being aware of it. That is an entirely different question of what capacities does your consciousness have once it has perceived existence. And there's all kinds of things you can do which do not consist of perceiving existence as a derivative. Once you have acquired a certain content, you can dream, you can introspect, you can study a mental image, you can hallucinate. 
And sometimes your brain can be deranged. But even then, you can't have a deranged hallucination of something that has absolutely no connection to anything you've ever perceived. First, you have to have some content. And then you can focus your awareness uh, inward, either through aberration, through disease, or through choice. And the result is you're in that moment not focusing on existence, but it's indirectly still derived from existence. It's like saying, it's exactly analogous to saying, if nothing exists, there are no words, because words can't refer to nothing. And you say, oh, yes, they can. What about Santa Claus? Now, would you say the word Santa Claus and the fact that it has a meaning refutes the proposition that uh, uh, words can't exist unless there's something for them to refer to? And yet there's no Santa Claus, right? Now, why? They're mixing levels all together. The phenomenon of words couldn't exist, concepts. If there wasn't something that we were then organizing, conceptualizing, symbolizing, once we have that framework, we can then do all kinds of tricks and combine our words in ways that have no counterpart. And we can even know what we're talking about. That doesn't violate the fact that a word has to stand for something. And the same is exactly true on the experiential level. I wouldn't call it perception, because a hallucination is not a form of perception. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it is an experience. And from that point of view, it's, a, it's an exact parallel. So you always have to remember the context in which uh, these statements are made. If she's talking on the level of existence exists, then she's speaking on the level of broad philosophic fundamentals that can be taken out of context to any state of consciousness, any word, any experience. I'm trying to get different people. Yes, right. In the chronological order of the action, we get to a point where you're at primacy of existence. Does one arrive at that, or does one arrive at a choice between primacy of existence and primacy of consciousness? No. As a child, do you, you said, do you arrive at the primacy of existence chronologically, implicitly, I assume you mean? Or do you arrive at the choice between the primacy of existence and primacy of consciousness? Absolutely not the second. It would be impossible. The whole thing is unconceptualized. It's implicit. And, you, and we're talking about, on the implicit level, something that happens implicitly to every child as soon as he is able to grasp that something is out there is against his awareness and that he can't do anything about it. On that level, you would have to be the most monstrously corrupt baby <laughs> to sit back and say, well, now, yeah, you know, Maybe there's another theory. Maybe I could change it. Which one should I accept? The, the baby couldn't conceive of choosing on any of the things that we discussed in this chapter, on the implicit, couldn't even dream of an alternative on the implicit level. Now, he starts to get alternatives when he you know, grows older and is corrupted by the adults, or he simply flounders by himself. Then he, he's, he's adrift. But on the level that we're here talking about, you don't start by saying, for instance, existence. Now some philosophers say non-existence. Should I accept it or not? You open your eyes, it is. And in the same way, you don't say, uh, even in baby terms, now my block is orderly and my ball is orderly. Now David Hume didn't believe this, so I accept causality or not. You can't even imagine these alternatives, you see. You just accept. You just take the corollaries as they, as they come to you. Uh, the whole thing is not in words, uh, uh, but it takes tremendous either corruption or adulthood to get to the stage of imagining alternatives. I have to give you just one apiece. I, I'm not taking that area, because I know what you have in mind, and you've already asked several times anyway. Supposed to be one a person. Yes, are you new? OK. Yeah. No, I think I asked you, didn't I? Yeah. I asked a question earlier, but I have a very short one. A very short philosophic question is self-contradiction. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> that was my question. Is it, uh, is it correct for me to regard consciousness as an entity? That also, is it correct to regard consciousness as an entity? Good question, no answer. Because the term entity is too broad. Yes, you can regard conscience as an entity, and I often say that. 
but then it has to be within the context of your usage. It's not an entity in the sense that man is an entity. It's not an entity as I define entity in the primary sense, a perceivable thing with a definite uh, shape, like a, you know, a rock or a table, etc. It's certainly not an entity in that sense. The whole realm of consciousness is extremely difficult to conceptualize in these terms, in terms of the categories, because it is unique and it can't be assimilated to the physical world. The categories that we use are not always a match or not always applicable to consciousness. It has certain features of an entity. It's a something. It's a this. It's not uh, 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 you know, just a free-floating uh, faculty. It does something. We say consciousness thinks, consciousness dreams, consciousness imagines, consciousness wishes. In that sense, there is a usage in which you can think of consciousness as a, an entity, meaning just a thing, a something, meant that does something. But once you've said that, and there's no harm in saying that. In fact, it's often you know, in, invaluable to say that. You have to recognize that you can't press that in the literal sense the way you would if you say a stone is a thing or a stone is an entity. Because consciousness ha can be put under just about every category, that, you know, category in Aristotelian sense. There is, depending upon how you look at it. Consciousness is a faculty of an entity. It's not an entity. It's our faculty of being aware. From that perspective, there's only one entity, namely man in this context. And consciousness is just one of his uh, uh, attributes, you see. So you can think of consciousness as an attribute, not an entity. From the point of view of doing something, you can think of it as an entity. From another point of view, if you think of consciousness as, in essence, a process, you know, on Rand's point that consciousness is continuous activity, perceiving, integrating, etc. It's not a static state. You can think of consciousness itself as a process. So Aristotle, you know, has these different categories, entity, attribute, process, etc. And they're, they're very important and useful as applied to the existential world. As applied to consciousness, though, there is no exact uh, application. And we have to, the best we can do is use these terms, but then try to make clear at all times that consciousness as such is sui generis. That is to say, it's unique. It is not of its own kind. It's, it, it's not, it can't be reduced to the material world in terms of, it can be described in the same terms that you describe a physical object. It is a distinct kind of faculty, a distinct kind of phenomenon. And you grasp it by introspection. That's what's meant by saying it's a primary. And therefore, ultimately, uh, the only way to grasp what it is, is you experience it. That's what it is. So I don't deny calling it an entity, but I don't make a song and dance about calling it an entity either. Does that answer you? Yes. Uh, this is one I wanted to ask yesterday, but just you just saying this reminded me. Where does, where does Aristotle's categories fit into this? Is, are they fit into the objectivist theory? Are they where, axioms? Are they? Where does Aristotle's categories fit into objectivism? We have no position, no set of categories. Ayn Rand did not think it was a profitable endeavor to define, at least from her point of view, to define a set of uh, exhaustive so-called metaphysical categories. She recognized, she agreed with Aristotle to this extent, there was entity, what he called primary substance. And then you could distinguish qualities, quantities, actions. Beyond that, she did not see the point of trying to take an inventory of all the possible types of summa genera, that is exactly where she refused to go. Because her point was beyond you know, what is absolutely indispensable to lay down the axioms. An entity is obviously indispensable. And to get rid of people like Heraclitus, you know, say there's only motion. Beyond that, you're trespassing on the realm of science. If you lay down a law such as entity, in the sense that we use it as a primary, is the fundamental metaphysical category. And then if science discovers meta-energy or whatever, everybody throws up their hands and say philosophy has been refuted. And it's precisely for that reason that she refused to go into 
a category, a metaphysical category, which is supposed to be more than simply the axioms. Once you go beyond axioms, she said, you're in the realm of science. And when you're in the realm of science, philosophers, you know, they can make certain distinctions, but that doesn't give them the status of metaphysical categories. So she would, I believe it's fair to say, call Aristotle's categories as a completely worked out table if that's what he had in mind, and it's even doubtful whether he had that in mind, she would regard that as a platonic or rationalistic hangover, and not a complete separation between philosophy and rationalism. Harry, is that you? John. Oh, John, sorry, OK. Well, alien to the scientific group in this area. <laughs> you what? Uh, I was just commenting on you. I don't take any questions. Well, because I see various hands waving that want to argue about the photon. I don't mind arguing. I just have two objections. I'm a horse, and everybody else is uninterested in it for a good reason. I'm not an alien from that group. No, no, I'm not. Let me correct this. If something bothers somebody, they should be free to raise it. Uh, I can't you know, force something down your throat, and I don't want to. But it doesn't make sense for you to persist once I've said I'm not going to discuss it. Because I won't. So, uh, but maybe I'm confusing different hands. Anyway, John, what's your question? My question is, would you comment on the materialists that I have heard who would say, listen, we don't deny the existence of consciousness uh, in the present uh, world. What we say is that uh, in time, that at some point, there were no consciousness atoms, everything was matter. And that in that sense, consciousness Very good, John. I'm glad. Glad you asked that, because I covered that. Um, <laughs> trying to find the page. Turn to page um, 49. The first full paragraph. There is no valid reason to struggle to reduce consciousness to matter. Not if such reduction means the attempt to define it out of existence. In other words, I leave open the possibility. I don't say that I know this is possible, because I don't. But I don't know that it's impossible. So I'm having that neutral. With regard to someday, physicists, biologists will get together and they'll be able to show that if you take three protons and four photons, I'll give them. Tom Phillips, <laughs> and stir them in a beaker, the result will be awareness. And that's all there is to it. Two protons and four photons, jiggle them together, and that leads to awareness. And as soon as you pull one photon out, it's inanimate or unconscious. <clears throat> Who knows? I don't know. My point, that's, if, if that's what you mean by reduction, I don't know. Maybe there is no such thing, such underlying consciousness at all. Maybe it's just a result of certain combinations of matter. I do not know, but the point is, let's assume that reduction were done 100%. It would change nothing philosophically. It is still a fact that when you put those two uh, electrons and four photons together, you get certain properties as a result that you didn't have when they weren't together. You get what we call awareness, and with all of its attributes. And that's what I list here. It wouldn't alter the fact, even if we did that reduction, that when those things are together, consciousness has certain functions, that they're unique, that they're not like anything in conscious <clears throat> entities. You cannot wipe consciousness out of existence by explaining it. So that even if you reduce it down to the crudest physical level, it's still there. You had to use your faculty of awareness to grasp its roots. Therefore, no so-called reduction or explanation will ever threaten the reality or the capacities of your faculty of awareness. The most they will do is give you the means to manufacture it at home. It will be like a new form of Nintendo. You know, so <laughs> you can play around in a beaker and come up with consciousness. But so what? Once you've come up with it, it's still there. It has all of its faculties and attributes. It knows what it knows. It, I mean, you haven't changed anything. You see what I'm saying? So focus on that middle paragraph on uh, 49, because that was put in specifically against reductionists.
Now, do we have time for one brief one? Well, we have, who has a short one? Huh. Is this short? Okay. So I think what you just said, someone could say, well, doesn't it sound like you could put the atoms of consciousness together and wind it up like a doll and then you're determined? Doesn't, doesn't that follow. Open? It doesn't follow. You say if you put the atoms together and they lead to consciousness, doesn't that mean consciousness is determined? No. All it means is if that were mechanism were correct, if that was, was the source of consciousness, the phenomenon of consciousness would be determined. It, given that physical substrate, consciousness would have to result. But that leaves wide open what kind of consciousness, what kind of brain, to use that uh, level of speaking, leads to what kind of consciousness. Now, the point would be, given a certain type of brain and a certain type of nervous system, the inevitable determined result is a consciousness with certain capacities of which one is that it's conceptual and thus volitional. So you, you're not erasing anything. Even if the faculty is determined, the nature of the faculty is still what it is. And therefore, if it's volitional, it's volitional. You get that? If you don't, think about it. We'll get to volition next time. Thanks.